We launched this initiative with a, a major uh, business university and social sciences university in Lisbon. I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm not, uh, uh, I'd say, a scientist. I've been an R&D engineer for many years, a few years, about seven years, uh, and then moved on to the venture uh, private equity uh, area. Um, my background is mechanical engineering. I worked at Hewlett Packard for uh, about four years. Um, did a few patents there, working on networking, uh, fiber optic products, uh, semiconductor, uh, telecommunications. Um, and before that, I did some uh, R&D uh, for the CERN in Atlas detector, for, uh, uh, which is now conducting the first experiments after 20 years I was there. So it's good to see that uh, some of our work now starts producing, after 20 years, uh, some benefits for society. So, uh, as I was saying, in 2009 we, we started thinking, how can we uh, revitalize the innovation technology transfer, create new technology startups that could revitalize and create a lot of jobs? We're still wondering uh, how we can do it, but there are some signs that we are on the right path. So we launched this uh, initiative, which is coupled initially to the MIT Portugal program, simply because <coughs> uh, there's, there's uh, a strong uh, magnet of talent, which is Boston, and we're trying to feed in somehow into this value chain of uh, creation. So we created this project <coughs> called Building Global Innovators, and we decided to conduct a one-year uh, accelerator program uh, that uh, then coaches the startups up to five years into the market. We, we must make sure that uh, we don't uh, uh, leave anyone behind and that we take the startups to the market, which is the goal, and obviously leveraging technology investments, either public or private. So this is uh, uh, the work that has been done over the last two years. Um, we, we take about nine years to select uh, down from, from about 100 applications a year down to uh, 12 teams that we particularly uh, uh, invest. Uh, when I say invest, is dedicate our time. And um, there's some rather interesting numbers com coming out of the process. <coughs> so we have the first uh, uh, panel uh, of selection that uh, picks 20 uh, candidates a year. It sometimes are companies, 50% are companies, 50% are ideas, um, or, or might have a, a proof of concept. Uh, but of these 50% that are ideas, the interesting number is that 80% of those 50% convert into startups. And that's very uh, encouraging because it uh, looks like people are benefiting fr from a, a, an accelerating program. Um, then obviously uh, you don't you don't uh, a great idea a great technology a great uh, proof of concept uh, is only applicable if you can convert it into a product uh, which is sellable that somebody needs it and then from a product you have to build a business which is completely something another beast. I was in life sciences. Uh, you you'll hear another story from Mike. Uh, a lot of these companies are purchased or are uh, sold uh, during say discovery. Uh, therapeutics or drugs, uh, which is a completely business, different business model. So some of the things I might say here might not be completely applicable to some another completely different beast, which is life sciences, therapeutics, drug discovery, etc. Uh, which, by the way, we tend to shy away a bit. You know, we, we touch biologics, we touch some later stage medical devices, uh, class one medical devices mostly. Uh, we tend to uh, look at much more at IT uh, across uh, fertilization opportunities where you know, uh, uh, Internet of Things and medical devices can, uh, uh, um, sensing devices for example for health system living is an area that we invest a lot of resources on. So there's been some job creation obviously and some money uh, being, being supported by VCs. In fact, uh, uh, the venture private community has been looking at us as a way of conducting <coughs> due diligence before making investments, which is very interesting. So we are kind of uh, being outsourced as a due diligence uh, uh, process for before putting the dollars in or, or euros in. Um, and I'll say eight, nine million of these uh, 16, 15, now there are 16, these outdated millionaires in, in, in funding have, got, have gone into um, 
about 24 startups over the last two years. Uh, so there's a, that's a very, very high ratio. And on average, we're talking about uh, 650,000 uh, euros per company of investment. The highest being in the region of 2.5 and the lowest being in the region of 30. So there's a, there's a very wide variety of investors. We, we do work a lot with uh, angels, with the angel community. Um, in order to create deal flow for the venture capital community. And deal flow was a major challenge, like, uh, say, three years ago. So I'd say the landscape in Portugal is uh, really changing very fast. And, um, uh, you know, three years ago, if you were to come in Portugal, uh, you'd not see uh, programs such as this, but, but also a number of other initiatives uh, being supported by a number of uh, not-for-profits and private initiatives that are now commonplace. Um, and uh, this is very important, obviously, to be still in the youth community and uh, uh, being them uh, PhDs or postdocs, wherever. We really encourage them to transfer and uh, monetize their, their ideas in a way or other. And obviously, uh, we are uh, an initiative that uh, is looking for impact. And this number is, is very important for our stakeholders being uh, government and private companies that put money on our hands. So these are some numbers in terms of breakdown of uh, the growing. Uh, these are, as I say, uh, not uh, uh, going to change landscape in Portugal, economic landscape tomorrow, but uh, they're, they're, they point us, they or they give us an idea that we are going the right direction. Uh, that uh, investors, uh, I'd say a major breakthrough is that we've had first investments about uh, three years ago from uh, Boston Angels in, in companies, uh, ICT companies, internet communication and technology companies. And um, these investors obviously are typically people, when we talk about business angels, does anyone know the difference between a business angel? Mike, you can't answer this, okay? Uh, business angel and a VC. What's the biggest difference? Both have money, uh, but what sort of money? Uh, Feel, please feel free to, I don't be shy, sorry? Business angels usually are people that manage other people's money, right? It's the other way around. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good guess. Like they have money and they want, and they search for companies or ideas to invest in, and not really working the direct profit like the VCs. Okay, uh, there are some ideas which are there. Okay. That's the main difference. So while VCs, uh, could be, say, uh, individuals that are looking for other people money, uh, banks or private funds or uh, other funds to invest or co-invest. An angel is someone who uh, made a career in a specific area um, and knows this area really well and they've probably done some, you know, uh, fairly well. So they either set up a fund with somebody else or invest in their own money. Uh, so the angels like to invest with, our, with other angels. So we say if I'm a, uh, an expert in therapeutics in uh, cancer, for example, I will look for somebody, uh, if I'm a scientist, I will look for another angel, pro possibly, which might complement my business uh, side, okay? And we might f make the first investment. Uh, there's the, whereas v a VC is, is somebody, somebody who's investing uh, much more institutional money you know, it doesn't really have to really have an, uh, an insight, a really in-depth in knowledge about the area. He knows he has to have good management in place and company is going to invest and somebody, somebody else has to build the company up to a stage where an institutional VC uh, might come in. Obviously, there are very clever VCs who, who are almost angels which have gone into the VC area uh, and that's the major difference. So, the, uh, an angel uh, uh, breaks the first uh, I would say uh, debugs the first risk, so it's really a de-risking activity in building up the product, in finding who the customer is, in finding who the first business, what the first business model might be, making the first sales, uh, which is the most challenging part, and then when the company needs to scale up, there might be VCs down the line. So that's the major difference. And there's a mix of both here. But obviously, when you talk about ideas, and this is what the organization asked me to focus on, the most important part of the business, or creating a business, is obviously building a product somebody needs to buy, and typically you want to find an angel who can provide you mentoring, coaching, business side, you know, really well, good, detailed knowledge of a specific opportunity. And that's something that's still hard in Portugal, because there's not so many people 
with, uh, I mean, there's very good people in Portugal, but they're employed working for large companies. They, there's, it's not a traditional uh, thing to say, if I'm a CEO of uh, PT, uh, create a startup. If you, there's not many cases. Does anyone know? I mean, there's a few cases, I could think of probably 10 or 15, but that's still an exception, right? And we want to change that. So we need to attract more talent to our community, and uh, that's part of our, our, our mission too. Uh, so one interesting aspect that I should uh, uh, mention is that some companies that have raised, say, a couple of million dollars or euros have, uh, are seeing in BGI an opportunity to enter a specific market, market. But not only that, but also enter the US market, for example, because uh, we're, we're, we're investing a lot in, the, not that the US has got all the answers right, it's not, not that, but uh, for some, some parts of the business is really much easier uh, when compared to uh, speed, for example, in Europe. Obviously, there's, there's exceptional examples. We have trials, for example, in Finland, uh, whereas in Portugal, we're talking with uh, large conglomerate companies and the, the slow response is, for, is, is low. Uh, 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 and uh, the, 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 obviously, uh, this is uh, for technology. I used to say technology is like a yogurt. Okay, so there's a shelf time. Yes? Uh, I have a question regarding the... Um, numbers. Yeah, numbers. So this uh, this happens because the those semi-finalists from the first edition have like kind of more time when they... You mean, you mean the, the, the yeah, reason why there's so much more the, money? Yeah, the, the three Yes, it takes so time. Right. So these guys have been working for, say, pilots for two years mm -hmm. and they've come to a stage where they raised money to enter the market, okay? Uh, whereas these guys have only been working for about a year, so this is from, uh, say, from uh, March, so there's only a year there. Whereas here, there's only three months, we closed in March, 1st of March, so there's only really three months of, uh, you know, because we, that's, that's the point I didn't mention, but this is the point from the, the, the point when, when the competition ends, that's 1st uh, of March every year, we start counting, okay? No, so that's the reason. My main question was, if it was like during it some time, you know, time then like for the first six months and so the, the third edition were much worse than the first yes. it's, it's it's Basically, it's it's as since the, the competition yes. started. It has, has to do with, with the, 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 the development stage of the company. Okay. okay? That's, that's, you know, but one, one big thing that you learn from that slide, it's a very good observation, is that initially after they got their first seed funding, they're very good at picking up grants. Yeah. That's true. And then with those grants, they actually validate what yeah. they're doing, yeah. and then they actually get their their real funding. Yeah. Does so it make sense? Seed, grant, yeah. VC. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, uh, in fact, every time we raise one euro from an angel, we try to leverage it for another at least a euro, which is sometimes not always one euro, but might be 60 cents. So we try to leverage. And that's the reason why we have 60 percent here from. Uh, uh, sorry, 40% from uh, uh, public sources, which is, you know, uh, uh, public funded uh, uh, grants, etc. That's the main reason. So we try to leverage as much as possible to avoid dilution. I don't want to get too technical, but uh, that's, that's an interesting part. So the other interesting part is that uh, we really went to the Caixa Geral board and I was negotiating, trying to persuade them for nine months that they should play a major role. This is uh, my career benefit. This is the largest public bank in Portugal. So everyone does have a, an account in Caixa Geral deposits. When, when you're two or three year old, it's a kind of a large institution, very slow, very bureaucratic. But I kind of, after nine months, they were crazy enough to believe that we were going to get somewhere. And in fact, uh, there's been a number of uh, new angels that have, have emerged or have become confidence now to, to kind of, you know, become this kind of uh, a public and uh, invest in these initiatives, whereas before they were shy, you know, take away somewhere, somewhere else, or investing uh, overseas, which is uh, taking money away. So we persuaded them to put one million euros a year uh, in four startups, uh, uh, but 50% of the, the money, it's a non-convertible uh, loan, uh, that uh, pays an annual interest of 2% in the first five years. 2%? 2%. You guys are so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cheap one, isn't it? 2%. It's unfair, right? And 4%. I, I come to Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> You're moving to Portugal. 2%? <laughs> 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 
It's really cheap money. You should, you should send some of your startups here to get this, grant, this money. So it's non-convertible, non-allocated money. And in the second five years, so cash is king. There's another expression that you should bear in mind if you're st kept starting a company. Don't spend too much cash, uh, cash uh, you know, uh, hiring expensive people. You need to offer them equity, which is the most valuable asset that you have. IP, your knowledge. Uh, you know, and, and build up the, the value of the company, and then uh, the, uh, you know, offer a partnership to key people that will need, will you'll need on board to build value. I won't go into much stuff. Yeah. Uh, if you want to uh, build your company or something that's sort of in the Portugal, how many business angels like Kaisha that you have the chance to uh, secure the money in Portugal? So I'm not sure I got your question. Uh, if you want to start up, if you want to build your company in Portugal, how yes. many business angel like Kaisha is you have the chance to, to find the business angel and start? Well, business angels love this this kind of money because it, for one is is uh, non dilutive Okay, so it's it's not it's not dilute, diluting the the, prom, the to the the promoters, so the, the founders. Okay, the second one is that it's really money that is use, being used to de-risk the company. When an angel might say, you know, you, it's an idea in the lab, I still need to invest half a million, and uh, th it's really a, a risky area. So it's a high ca capex area. I don't want to take that chance. So go away and, and find some grants come back when you've got some more validation done. If an angel is, is, is not careful, he will go bankrupt because yeah, you know exactly. he might get in love with the company. So an angel must be very rational in terms of decisions. But also, an angel is not someone who's supporting you forever. Uh, 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 an interesting aspect is that you know, really good angels know exactly who's going to buy a company before they invest. And they start grooming the exit before they invest. You know, for example, I'll give you an example. IBM might invest in a startup of ours, but not right away from start. So if they're interested in the startup, they'll call the phone, hey John, you need to put some money in because I, I'm buying this company when it gets to this point. I'm, I, this is really an interesting area that I'm looking for deal flow. So some, some, some institutional VCs, not this case, not this case, but corporate VCs, okay? Uh, corporate venturing, so large companies are are in need of desperately of open source innovation and collaborative models, which is where we come in, right? Yeah. Uh, because the, the speed, metabolic speed of innovation is is really kind of uh, picking up, and uh, large companies, if they're not careful, they're going out of uh, business soon, right? You're laughing. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think I do. Okay. Yes, it's really a problem. So. Has uh, anyone, uh, I mean, you probably have heard of Open Innovation and uh, Clayton Christensen and then Henry Shesbra. So these guys are really kind of changing the way business is done because of uh, new business models are required. And in fact, I can give you my own example. Uh, when I started off in 2000 working for uh, Newland Packard, um, is there any water? Um, so when I worked back in 2000, uh, I was working in London in a site with about uh, 1,800 employees. When I left Ilot Packard four years after, or uh, five years before 45, whatever, uh, in 2005, there was uh, only 123 employees. Right? <coughs> Some markets where we were playing a major, where HP was a leader, submarine pumps, repeaters, routers, etc., had been taken over by one of our major customers, guess what? They want to have the shame, Cisco. Why? Instead of doing it in-house, they kind of spreading 10% of their operational margin went into buying companies outsourced, you know, outside our perimeter. Whereas in Yellow Packard, if you wanted to develop something, you had to build it in-house, right? Otherwise, nobody, nobody, you know, it's not a respectable solution. So. Hewlett Packard had uh, really large uh, R&D facilities, and it's called the not invented year syndrome, right? So if you want to enter in an area, you have to build it. The IP has to be yours. Uh, you have to market it, get first to market, etc. That's all upside down. That middle model, sorry, is, is all upside down. You don't have to build it. You don't have to research it. You don't have to own the IP. 
You just have to make money of, the, of, of an opportunity that you see fast and then uh, 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 sample the bits and pieces to make it happen. And that's the model that uh, enabled real. Enabled Cisco, for example, uh, you look back and I can give the example. Uh, when I started working for HP, they, the turnover was around uh, 26 billion dollars. So that, that's 26,000 million uh, US dollars, so, uh, dollars okay? Uh, now, uh, and, and by the way, Cisco was about 6.5. So the size of Sonai, a bit, a bit smaller, okay? Sonai is a large con conglomerate in Portugal, everyone knows, right? Who doesn't know Sonai? I can give you another example. Okay, so uh, today, who wants to guess what the situation is? 10 years, you know, uh, 13 years after. Have a guess. Sorry? What? Billion? You look back hard? What, what's, what's that turnover today? You look back hard? They're having a lot of trouble since the last 10 years. I'll tell you. You left. <laughs> that's, that's part of the reason. That's the reason. So I take my redundancy package and finish my, my thesis because I did. I was working and studying at the same time. And then I said, you know, it's a good time because the redundancy package is there. I survived seven rounds of redundancy and said, give me the money, it's time to go because you're you're just out of this game. It's part of the reason. So there's a point. You know, it's like angels leaving the business. There's a point when you need to leave, right? Because you see, you know, the ship is going down. So that's part of the reason. Well, spot on. Uh, but but um, so today the situation is: Hewlett Packard turnover is about 12, 13, uh, and Cisco is about getting to 30 billion. And the major difference is that 50, more than 50 percent of the innovations, that means marketed products. Innovation. My definition of innovation is actually money being created from marketing new solutions, right? Um, that, that's, by the way, the, the, the Oslo definition, you know, creating money, jobs, etc., out of something new. Um, uh, it's not just an invention, so you need to market it to, to actually uh, make money. So where Cisco is 30, you look back card is 12. So you see in, in 13 years, there's been a complete shift and in, in all over industry, you know, in other industries, if you pick different industries, this is happening. I mean, Mike will tell you about the business model for pharma, for example, today. You know, patents are going off uh, very fast, and these companies are, are in real need of nimble startups working in biotech, drug discovery, etc. You name it, process downstream processing, uh, excipients, you name it. They, they need it all because they're, they're going out of not business. They still they have long deep pockets still, they can go and shop. Um, but uh, the, the business model is, is becoming uh, uh, very fastly disruptive. And that's where uh, models like this, uh, uh, like BGI, can, can actually, and should, and are, we are actually trying to fit in startups, you know, internationally, into collaborative networks where it makes sense for us to add value, where, where, where it makes sense uh, for us to really uh, get, get involved. And part of my uh, uh, gray area is coming from, you know, this kind of due diligence and interactions with these uh, larger, much larger uh, companies than uh, fragile ecosystem made of startups. That's, that's part of my responsibility. So the key point here is that we need to encourage for Portugal, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. And uh, what we want is take some ideas with some money with some uh, background research, could be a PhD uh, thesis, could be postdocs, could be, you know, could be an idea out of uh, uh, even a master thesis. We have some of those. Uh, as long as the, the right time to market is right, uh, we have uh, some, some uh, knowledge in the area, we are supporting these kind of ideas and startups. And obviously, in Portugal, you might be successful in raising, say, one or two million, uh, exceptionally, maybe a round off to a syndicate of three or four investors, international and national, you might get lucky to five, but that's game over. After that, if you need uh, 50 million, forget it. You're not going to get it in Portugal because nobody has the deep pockets, nor the willingness, nor the track record to be able to, to put money behind any startup that might, might uh, ever uh, emerge at this point in time. There's just not the funds there nor the track record. You know, people have got their fingers 
badly burned. Uh, and there's in biotech, there's a few uh, exceptional uh, uh, stories, but there's uh, the, the, the reality is that a lot of uh, euros have been uh, uh, destroyed because of lack of you know, deal flow, etc., and support infrastructure that's required. Mike, I'm sure you're going to talk about that. Uh, we just talked about that a few minutes ago. So, to give you a perspective, uh, this is also mainly for the benefits of some of you and uh, Michael. Uh, Mike, so, so we have about uh, uh, you have to put another 100 applications for now for the fourth edition. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, the strong area in Portugal is obviously ICT. That's where most of the, uh, the technology transfer is coming, most of the IP is coming. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a very good uh, talented area here in, in, in life sciences, but there's just not, not enough, uh, I'd say, culture to actually ignore no support. Yes? Just a quick question. Um, I see that um, most of these competitions, uh, it's a problem that I see they're always designed normally now for the ICT industry. But, uh, how is it uh, in this case uh, regarding that aspect? Um, we're not designed only for the ICT. But we, we need to be pragmatic. So the ICT barriers to entry in the ICT areas are lower than, for example, in, in life sciences, therapeutics, drug discovery, etc. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that there's critical mass in ICT. So if you want to build an ecosystem, you need to look at the ingredients that you need to support it. Uh, Where it's much easier for Portugal, which is in a desperate, dire situation, to build up some companies and exit with profits, in this area, we'll need people like Mike to actually integrate. You know, they, they, we might uh, uh, have to uh, outsource some of development. We might have to be outsourced some of development, for example. But you're certainly not going to get, say, new vaccines every day. Uh, I mean, Bial, for example, I was talking to Luis Patella the other day, you know, the son of the founder, and uh, I was asking, uh, this drug that you just marketed in uh, asthma, right? Asthma patients. Um, is it going to be uh, uh, bottom line zero? Or are you going to? Is it, is it a major breakthrough? Obviously, it is because it's the first drug in Portugal. You know, right from they they went all the way, right from discovery through to the process through the market. That's an exceptional case. It took them 14 years. They have six years now to really. Uh, uh, recover the 560 million euros invested, they and they were telling us, yes. The biggest R and D investment, is what they were, I believe. In terms of this area, I was, the, uh, I was, share of. Uh, I would say so. In terms of uh, <laughs> biotech, for sure, yes. Obviously, there's a lot of government money there. There's a lot of uh, their own resources there. But if it is, if this is was not going to happen, they will have gone bust. You know, they were lucky, but they're still not going to break even. When you look at money going in, whereas the, all, they license the drug now for all over the world. It's just not enough to support the investment they did, not accounting for the cost of capital. So if you take, you know, if you account for 12% uh, average cost of capital, for 13 or 14, uh, it's still a minus in the bottom. That's part of the learning process. It does, 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 does not mean that they should not have done it. It just means that if they were to make it now, they would do it in a different way. Not all the way, but they would have licensed probably or uh, found out you know, that, that there might be other players where they could partner to support some of the process. That's, that was their main uh, finding. So it's, it's, it's a complete beast. You know, it takes an average. I, this is really Mike's area, but. Um, you know, I can tell you that it takes an average of uh, 600 to, 700 to 900 million dollars per drug from the drug discovery through to, and the odds is 1 to 10,000, right? Am I, am I right? Yeah, it's, it's not, you invest 900 million and you have yeah. a chance of 1 to 10,000, right? yeah. you cut off on the way. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's and it's a, it's a stage gate process. <laughs> I mean, Mike can tell you about that, but uh, uh, much more. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that we tend to shy away from those because it's, uh, although our, it's Boston is very strong, uh, we try to maximize the number of uh, euros put in and results that can be leveraged. I mean, it won't be 500 million opportunity, but there might be startups that are nimble 20, 40, 50 uh, million euros. Take the money and run. Yeah. 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 Ye
<laughs> to it. It's just, we don't have an option. Yeah. We just need to make as much money with as little as possible as, as we can. No, but I mean, you guys <laughs> try to get in, take their money and run. <laughs> and go to Boston. <laughs> or to Holland. No, 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 stay in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, when he's talking about making money, that's his problem. <laughs> you, you will have your own problems. Yeah. yeah. Some of them are common, but uh, yeah. yes, it's, uh, you're right. So, so, um, so we, we then created this competition mainly for two uh, targets. Uh, we call one of them is innovators, so 50% of the submissions. In fact, this year was 56%, which is good because we want to work more with these people, uh, and we want these guys to get in to this process through other accelerators, other you know, percent uh, <coughs> to and other other. Uh, processes, competitions at universities. So we want to get uh, 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 these startups at the right time in, 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 in the right, right point in time. Um, so there's four areas we launched. Uh, we now just are now right, we're just conducting 12 interviews a day now. To now we're down from 100 to 50, and then 50 to 20. So what we must make sure is that we don't leave any false positives in, okay? Because they're not good candidates. They're not committed. They don't have the willingness to build the vision and the strategy for the company. That's the first thing we need to avoid. False positives, because we don't have too much money. And we need to make sure that you maximize uh, the, the years that are put in the program. And the second one is that we don't leave any false negatives uh, out. Okay? So we, we must make sure that we do our job right in these areas. Um, so our, our process is really building up a community, uh, which is now over 120 investors worldwide. And uh, we really need to build this model, which is collaborative. I mean, countries like OSL and is doing much better than us. They're obviously much more than us. And they, they, they started doing this work much previous, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, we, we just woke up, Portuguese guess what, woke up too late for this process. And now we're trying to run uh, to survive, and that's uh, part of our mission is to uh, support Portugal in this process. So these are the numbers. So now we have 48 active startups. Uh, we have a brochure. I didn't bring any. Actually, I did. Sorry. Um, I'll distribute the brochure uh, soon, and you can have a look. And you should also, you know, if you're if you have an interest in any of these, uh, if you have an interest in any of these startups, you know. Don't contact me, contact startups themselves, talk about them. There's one there, um, Christiana. So, Christiana, you can also come here to the stage and provide a small couple of minutes talk on your experience in Boston, what you learned over the crash course, which is not intensive, it's just a, a kind of a week holiday, right? Oh. <laughs>